Hello Brain Shakers, welcome to the Brain Shakers Academy. We continue looking at the process of labor and in today's session we're definitely going to be looking at the first stage of that process. Now we did make mention in our earlier sessions that the first stage of labor is a stage that transcends from the onset of regular rhythmic uterine contractions all the way up until the cervix is classified as 10 centimeters dilated and if you haven't watched that video do look out for that video on my facebook page and the youtube page as well which is the brain shakers academy and if you have not subscribed please do remember to share as well so let's quickly get into today's session and understand the physiology of the first stage of labor Okay, so with the physiology of the first stage of labor, we have what is known as uterine action, and we also have other factors that we are then going to classify as mechanical factors. Okay, so as we look at uterine action, what is happening within the uterus for the uh, first stage to then culminate into that transition from the onset of the regular rhythmic uterine contractions to about 10 centimeters dilation. So there is what we call a fundal dominancy. So fundal dominance, this is when the contractions have actually started. So you have this part here that we are going to be calling the fundus. That is the fundus of the uterus. And then you have these ends, which are openings to the fallopian tubes that we call the corners of the uterus. So usually a uterine contraction then will start from or emanate from the corners of the uterus, spreads to the fundus here, and then spreads to the entire uterus, where then it reaches peak on the whole uterus at the same time but then you will feel the intensity of the contraction at the fundus and this explains why when you are palpating for any contractions you will then place your hand around the fundus of the uterus to palpate for the duration and the intensity of that uh, contraction so that is what we refer to as fundal dominance it means that during that time of uterine action it is more dominant around the fundal area then we have what we call polarity. Okay, now polarity, this is just the neuromuscular harmony that occurs between the upper uterine segment and the lower uterine segment. So during pregnancy, you understand also that uh, there's going to be formation of the upper uterine segment and the lower uterine segment. Sometimes it may happen towards the end of pregnancy or happen during uh, the stage of labor where you have the body and the fundus forming the upper part of the uh, uterine segment segment and then you have the isthmus and the cervix there forming the lower portion of the uh, uterine segment. So there's going to be harmony in that the upper uterine segment is going to contract and retract but not relax. It's going to contract and retract. By retracting, we mean that once it has reduced its size in terms of muscle size, it does then not go back to its relaxed stage here it means that it is going to maintain some form of contraction within it that is a retracting so it contracts and then relaxes partially and not completely so that is what is going to be happening in the upper uterine segment then in the lower uterine segment what is going to be happening now is that there's going to be contraction and then dilatation now those two processes that are happening in the upper uterine segment and in the lower segment are then different but then they are able to happen at the same time when you're having a uterine contraction and that is what we call neuromuscular harmony okay called polarity okay from polarity then we can talk about what we are just from talking about which is basically contraction and retraction Okay, so the contraction and retraction effect is basically what happens within the upper uterine segment. And this is what is going to help, obviously, in reducing the intrauterine cavity or volume by making sure that when the muscles here do contract. So if there is contraction of the muscles like that, and then when the contraction is over and they have to revert back to their 
uh, odd position. They will not relax all the way until they reach their starting points here. They will retain some form of contraction within the meaning that if they were at uh, point X here, then they will become and um, uh, contract and retract only up to point Z. Okay, so X was the original point and then they come into uh, Z. The next time again there is a contraction, it means that this muscle also contracts and then when it is retracting it does not go back to point Z but still contains within it some form of retracted um, uh, state. So that is about contraction and retraction. And then obviously we would have uh, our uh, formation that is of the upper uterine segment and the lower uterine segment, which we have also made mention. So upper and the lower uterine segment. So that is what is happening in the body of the uterus and the fundus are forming the upper uterine segment and then you have the isthmus and the cervix forming the lower portion or the lower uterine segment then from there you have what we are going to call a retraction ring okay so the retraction ring here this is just what forms in between the two uh, segments that have formed the upper uterine segment and the lower uterine segment. Normally you will not see the retraction ring. It's just an anatomical ring that forms between the upper uterine segment and the lower uterine segment. When it becomes more visible, then it means that it could be pointing to you that you are having or dealing with an obstructed labor. It means that there is a disharmony that has now happened between the upper uterine segment and the lower uterine segment. It means that the lower uterine segment obviously is not forced to contract and dilate as it is supposed to be dilating and so all that pressure that is exerted on the cervix then will come and be housed around the retraction ring there. And so when it becomes more visible now, it becomes pathological and it is now going to be called a bundles ring. Okay, so that is a pathological and it would be pointing you to uh, having to deal with an obstructed labor. From the retraction ring there, then we have what we call cervical effacement. Okay, that is cervical effacement. Now, cervical effacement is uh, basically the taking up of the cervix. Now, what is going to be happening here is that the inner portion or the inner os of the cervix is also going to be lifted as there is going to be that contraction aspect as well. It will be taken up so that it becomes part of the upper uterine segment. So the pulling aspect of the cervix then reduces the length of the cervix. So that reduction in the length of the cervix is now what we're going to be calling as effacement because before effacement, you find that this uh, cervical canal is actually going to be about two to four centimeters uh, in length. Then when effacement begins, it means that there has to be a reduction in the length of that canal. And then that will then facilitate for the dilatation process. Meaning that from cervical effacement, then we come to look at cervical dilatation. So then we are going to have cervical dilatation. Now, what is happening in cervical dilatation is that as the cervix is going to obviously being pulled like that, as the cervix is being pulled and becoming part of the other uh, part of the uh, uterus, what is also going to be happening now is that there is going to be pressure that is exerted by the presenting part onto the cervix, meaning that the cervical canal has reduced in its length. And once it has reduced in its length, it becomes even softer and also dilates to open up. So the cervical dilatation that is happening here is the opening up, which is the movement of the cervix in that manner. So if you want to remember on a cervical effacement, cervical effacement is the movement of the cervix in that direction, which is the taking up of the cervix, and cervical dilatation is the movement of the cervix into opposing direction, meaning that creating more room for the fetus to then pass and be delivered. And as 
it begins to dilate, you will find that the operculum that had formed here, which is just a plug that is going to form here, then is going to get dislodged. And because there are terrestrial blood vessels here that show or the speculum uh, or operculum that is going to come out is going to come and may at times be blood tinged as well. So that is the cervical dilatation that is obviously going to have a happened. Now, that is uterine action. Now, what happens on the aspect of mechanical factors? Now that the cervix has fully dilated or the cervix has begun to open, what is going to happen is that since you have a cervix that is open now, there's going to be seepage of fluid in front of the presenting part, which is the vertex. We're talking about a normal presentation here, which is a cephalic presentation. There's going to be seepage of fluid in front of the presenting part because there's no more protection and covering here. So you will find that there's going to be a bag of waters. This is the level of the presenting part. So you have your presenting part here, which is obviously the leading part, the anterior aspect or the vertex. Then you have fluid that accumulates here. So when we're looking at mechanical factors, we're going to look at the formation of the four waters, what we call four waters, and the hind waters. Meaning what is in front of baby's head is four waters, and what is at the back of baby's head is what we'll refer to as the hind waters. Now, from there, we are going to have what we call the general fluid pressure. General fluid pressure. Okay, so general fluid pressure is when the uterus is actually contracting. As it is contracting, it is exerting pressure on the hind waters there. Now, because the fluids in there cannot be compressed, they're incompressible, what is then going to happen is that that pressure is going to be generally equalized onto the uterine lining and the uterine walls and also onto the fetus itself. So that pressure will then be equalized on the fetus. Then that takes us to what we call the fetal axis pressure. Because of that uh, same generalization of the an equalization of that pressure, then you have fetal axis pressure. Now, fetal axis pressure, this is where as the uterus is then contracting here, it is applying that pressure direct to the fetal bridge, which is the fetal buttocks, and then that pressure is going to be, so if you have a, a a fetus in that position and the uterus here is contracting meaning that that pressure is going to be exerted onto the fetal buttocks and then will travel through the long axis of the fetus which is through the fetal back and then applied onto the presenting part which is uh, or the presenting uh, part which is obviously going to be um, uh, the cephalic or the head here and this is going to help it be it in a flexed position so that the smaller diameters then are going to be the ones that are going to then be able to negotiate the pelvic uh, diameters and I have also done another video on pelvic diameters if you haven't seen that do check out for it on my youtube channel which is the brain shakers academy now once we have looked at the fetal axis pressure then what is going to happen that continuous pressure and the fact that there is no longer protection of these four waters here because the cervix has then dilated what is going to happen is that the pressure within the uterine cavity then has gone to levels where the membranes can no longer hold it and then you end up having what is known as the rupture of membranes. It means that the waters that are in front of baby's head are going to break and then you have an opening there that we often call the fenestrum and that is the opening through which the baby is then going to be delivered and to come out uh, from. So this is basically what happens within the first stage of labor where you have uterine action or the activities that are happening within the uterus and some of the mechanical factors that are at play in line with the uterine activity and the fluid then exerted onto the fetus in order to get that fetus out of the uterus and then you have a baby and that would have culminated into um, a completion of the first stage because the expulsion of the baby now becomes the process of the second stage. So if you did find this particular video helpful and insightful, please don't hesitate to give me a thumbs up, share the video as much as possible, and don't hesitate to drop me comments as well in the comments section. Please do follow me on Facebook as the Brain Shakers Academy. And also don't forget to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is the Brain Shakers Academy. Hit that notification button so you don't miss any 
video of these amazing pieces. Thank you so much for watching and I would definitely see you in the next one.